My name is Rebecca Bronowicki. I am the local history student at the Lincoln Public Library. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the history of the Beamsville Aerodrome. But first I wanted to mention that the Lincoln Public Library is located on land that has been inhabited by the indigenous peoples from the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge the, ter uh, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people, many of whom continue to live and work here today. We also recognize the contributions First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community, our province, and our country. Also, I want to let everybody know that there is another Zoom program on September the 30th. It's an evening fostering reconciliation in Canada. There are still spots available, so if anybody would like to sign up for that, that's another interesting, somewhat historical topic. Uh, there are also programs every week for kids, such as the Tech Club and something cool after school. I'll also be posting a link to more information and a lot of the sources that I used at the end of this talk. So if anybody is curious about where I got this information, you can look at that at the end. And if anybody is watching this later, it should be underneath YouTube video. So we're mostly going to be talking about the Beamsville Aerodrome, but first I actually wanted to briefly go over the beginnings of the Air Force in Canada. And I think that a really great place to start is with this quote that talks about how, how different the world was once, or once airplanes began to be used in battle. But one day the face of war changed forever. Above the heart sinking mud of France, sort of flying machine, Used at first by the army for forward observation, it was considered useless by many. Useless until someone attached machine guns to it. Useless till someone devised a way to drop bombs from it. A third killing power will now be added to the European war. Every nation, along with the army and navy, would have an air force. This quote is from William Chudzkowski, and it's from the book Royal Flying Corps, Bor Borden to Texas to Beansville, which actually is at both the Rittenhouse Library and the Fleming Library. The, the Air Force was generally an underrated part of the military at first. It was mostly used for scouting missions. When the British during World War I decided to put more effort into it was after they suffered really heavy losses against the Germans who had been advancing their Air Force quite a bit. This happened in 1916, and the British decided to build up their own Air Force. Most of the British men were already fighting in the army, so they ended up turning to Canadians. They began recruiting for the Royal Flying Corps in Canada, 1916. It was a really popular career because it was new and exciting. They were far behind the lines, so generally they would be in good conditions. They would be fed and clothed, and even if they, would, they were going to die, then they would be in good conditions to the end, unlike the ground troops who would be wet and cold and not have food as readily available. The people who were recruited were men, 18 to 30, and men over 25 had to pass special qualifications. The people recruited had to attend high school for three years or take a special course. They had to be absolutely medically fit. Pay was $1.10 per day during instructions, including accommodations and uniforms. 25 cents to 50 cents per day for flying. The term was four years or until the end of the war. The first base was actually not in Beamsville. It was in Borden. Around May 1917, it became overcrowded. And on top of that, winter was coming and they knew it would be very difficult to train there. So they had to find a new base. The, tra the trainees ended up moving to Texas over the winter of 19 from 1917 to 1918. Why Beamsville? Brigadier General C.G. Hoare, who was the RFC commander in Canada at the time, he was responsible for the school coming to Beamsville. He wrote, to cope with next year, I've got an excellent site in the warmest part of Canada, where I shall get a more complete school going in the spring. It is Beamsville, Ontario, near Hamilton. So I have a picture here you can see of Beamsville around 1918. You can see it's very green. There isn't a lot of built up areas. It's because it was mostly a farming community. They, they bought land off the farmers in order to build the aerodrome. So 
what exactly was at the base. On October 5th, 1917, Royal Engineers came from Hamilton to look over the area and make preparations for construction. 300 acres were bought from local farmers and 75 acres were bought on the shore of Lake Ontario. Three by mi five miles was marked on the lake for bombing and machine gun practice. 25 acres were eventually added to make room for a machine gun range. And just briefly, I want to look at the physical location itself. This is a map we have in the collection at the uh, Ridden, Rittenhouse branch. And you can see how layout was. Layout. And you can see some street names that you might recognize as well. So using this, I actually looked into figuring out where the base would have been. And so you can get a bit of a better idea of how large it was by looking at it here. So I'm going to just go over some of the buildings that were there. There were 12 hangars. There are 110 by 66 feet. There was whoops, a garage, a blacksmith shop, a coal and wood storage building, an ice house, a gunnery office, a guard house, latrines, an administrative building, which you can see here with two officers in front. There was an armory, a mess. This is the mess here. This is uh, inside. This is the place where the cadets would have eaten. And this is the officer's mess, which you can see the door to the area where the cadets would be. There was a hospital and a ravine which got turned into a gunnery. Transit became a lot easier to the base because of the Grand Trunk Railway, which ran a spur line from the village to the camp. The barracks were, were actually not built until October 1918. So the officers ended up getting housed in private homes and uh, the cadets ended up living in tents, which you can see a lot of them right here. And here's another one with the cadet standing in front of a tent. And you might think that these look kind of small, but here we got six cadets who fit themselves into a tent and they look pretty happy about it. Eventually there were about 1000 cadets uh, housed at the base. I want to take a moment to focus more specifically on some people who are important to the base. First is Brigadier General Cuthbert Hoare, and I was not able to find a picture of him. I have just a, a demonstration of the people who would have been at the base since he was generally in charge of all of it. He was, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Hoare, uh, and he was chosen by the British authorities to lead the Canadian training program for the IRC. He was seen as an ideal candidate because he was already experienced, having learned to fly in 1911 and led both land and air force in France. He was seen as being very diplomatically skilled. Despite moving up in the ranks, he had no real enemies and he came to creative solutions when dealing with the Americans so that they received training and in turn would support the, R the RFC mission. He was also able to use these skills to advance the acceptance of women on more equal terms or at least uh, attempt to do so. At the beginning of the war, women usually filled clerical roles, as was seen as normal for the time. They eventually moved more into jobs that were uh, heavily traditionally male. As more and more men left these positions to go to war, these included driving trucks, working as mechanics, repairing and overhauling, en and repairing and overhauling engines. Hoare took women one step further by obtaining an agreement from London to create a woman's Air Force branch. Unfortunately, the plan was abandoned because the cost of creating women's uniforms and housing them was seen as too much. Another important man in school was Captain Albert E. Godfrey. He was the base commander. He likely had the most flying experience of, every, of anyone at the school. He was a very skilled pilot and he knew it. One of the most famous stories of his time at the base had to do with Brigadier General Hoare. After the armistice, Hoare visited the school and wanted to see Niagara Falls. He asked Godfrey to fly him over and they flew at 3000 feet over the falls. Hoare motioned for them to descend. They dropped and they got just above the head of the falls. When Hoare didn't seem satisfied, Godfrey dived into the gorge. They flew under the honeymoon bridge where unexpected winds caused the plane to shudder. Afterwards, he, he flew under a lower bridge and then flew close to the, and then had to fly close to the rooftops while ascending again. The maneuver Godfrey did had been forbidden to the cadets. 
When they returned, Hor stated that Godfrey would never fly again. This turned out just to be a reaction in the moment because later he recommended Godfrey to be an active major and called him a fine pilot and officer. Training included all the ins and outs of working with aircraft and warfare. Some skills that were taught were to use the wireless radio, read maps, meteorology, working with airplane and engine construction. They were taught how to make aerial observations, read instruments, and take aerial photographs. The photo I showed earlier of Beamsel was actually suspected to have been taken by one of the cadets. Flight training was done with dual camera guns. Dual camera guns were very useful for correcting aim because the images that they took with the cameras would have actually been stamped with a reticule, which showed pretty exactly what they were aiming at. Something I would highly recommend is reading an article at earlyphotography.co.uk because it goes into much more detail how the gun works, which is actually pretty complicated and interesting. It's a bit more complicated than I can cover in this talk, so I'll provide a, a link to this article at the end. This is an image of the gun storage room. Camera guns are at the bottom here. Uh, these are Vickers machine guns at the top, and shotguns are along the back wall. This is a cadet training with a Vickers machine gun. Uh, these are some images here of the machine gun training ground. And it shows you kind of the distance they would have practiced. You can see there are also some little planes above here. I did not find anything about what exactly they would have been. And so of course the next major training tool were the planes. The planes they used were Curtis Jan 4 Canucks, which were nicknamed Jennies. Canuck was part of the name because these specific ones were made in Canada instead of the United States. And you can make out that there was a front and back seat, and the dual guns would have been above and below each other on the plane. Flight training would have been done mostly over the water. There would have been silhouette targets. There were armored submarines. And here's another picture of them. Water was actually an instant accuracy check because they would be able to tell exactly where their bullets had gone because there would have been water splashes. Air flight, fight training was done with the camera guns um, and sometimes they would start flying with jammed guns so that they had to work on unjamming them mid-air. Not everything at the base was explicitly war training. There were extracurricular activities such as the band and sports activities. On August 17th, 1918, sports day was held and a Beamsville private won in uh, the individual challenge cup. There was also a lot of entertainment provided to the people of Beamsville. They watched fi pilots fly, and many pilots tried out stunt flight. On Victoria Day, they stunted over the fairgrounds. Um, <laughs> there's also an unauthorized exhibition over Stanford, and I saw this article in the Beamsville Express that talked about one woman putting her apron over her head because she's so sure that there would have been a crash during that exhibition. There was also stunting for challenge. Um, pilots tried to go under the steel arch bridges on the Niagara River. They, they were copying a stunt pilot named Lincoln Beachy, who flew under the bridges in 1911. Some were successful. One even did a loop over the bridge to celebrate. Even some less impressive stunts brought joy to the community. <laughs> on September 7th, six pilots flew over, over Thorold. One took pictures of the area, while well, another dropped a letter addressed to Mrs. Church from her son, Max. And I think this is one of the early examples you can see of airmail. Unfortunately, not every event at the base was positive. There were quite a few crashes. Some of them were just pranks, which are crashes with no major effect. But quite a few were fatal. These weren't even mostly from stunting, but rather from things going wrong in the normal schedule of the base. A plane would go out of control. Weather would make it more difficult to see. And since the pilots were training, they would just naturally make mistakes. Usually they were flying with a teacher who could take over, but sometimes things just happen very quickly. On May 2nd, uh, just for an example of an event, on May 2nd, 1918, a plane was taking off while another was landing just as the sun was rising. At least one of the crews was blinded by the sun and they crashed midair. Two trainee, the two trainees who were sitting in the front of the plane both died. But there were some crashes where the pilots were saved by incredible circumstances and some good people. 
On June 5th, a plane went out of control and crashed into Lake Ontario. The pilot was saved from the chance of drowning by happening to land in a shallow part of the lake. The nose of the plane stuck directly in the mud, and the pilot was able to climb out on the wing while the cadets who had seen him crash mounted a rescue mission. Major Ballard, the camp com- commander, had a crash on June 19th. He'd been flying back from Detroit when he found he was running low on fuel. He circled over Talbotville and once again gathered a crowd. They took down a fence for him and created a landing field. Once he got his fuel and was ready to take off again, he began taxing down the same field. A farmer walked directly into his path and Ballard swerved into two fences at five miles per hour to avoid him. The plane was wrecked, but fortunately no one was injured. So just a, a quick note on the use of this image here. This is an, from a comic book that we have in our collection. We don't know too much about, so I'm using these images in more of a representative manner, but I'll go more into detail about the comic book at the end. Another unfortunate occurrence was the uh, 1918 influenza pandemic. The hospital was full. One barrack ended up being converted into a new hospital ward. The band concert was canceled. The cadets were quarantined. And you can see how disappointed people were with the quarantines here in this comic. And even that they're wearing some some masks in this picture. And I think us modern people viewing this can understand maybe all too well what the cadets would be feeling. No one really knew when the war was going to end. The the base ended up continuing to build up and change. Um, They added parts that would never be used. One of these was the indoor machine gun range, which was meant to be used in the winter. General Hoare visited the camp on August 1st, 1918, and announced that they would be switching to Avro 504s as training planes. One plane came to Beamsville before the armistice and only two had been built in Canada by the time the war ended. Even once the armistice happened, there were plans to keep the bases open in order to keep up with training just in case something happened again. The decision to finally close the bases happened because of two fatal or debilitating accidents that happened on the same day, November 22nd. As of February 1919, the offices were abandoned And in March, the last JN-4 was flown from Beamsville to Toronto. The price to keep up the base as a museum was seen as too much, so it was demolished and orchards began growing up in the area. You might be thinking, well, what is left of the aerodrome today? What we're looking at is a picture of uh, the last remaining hangar. It's in use right now by Global Horticultural Inc. And there are also plaques to commemorate the site at Regional Road 81, Son Road to the east, and Bartlett Road to the west. Um, I have only been able to find the one on Sand Road, which, if you're curious, is on 4222 Son Road. Now I'm just going to talk about some of the materials that I used, and then we can open it up for discussion. First is our Ontario. A lot of the images that I got came from there, and you can find that on the library website. The other one is the Royal Flying Corps, Borden to Texas to Beamsville, which, as I said before, can be found at both Lincoln libraries. And then there is the comic. This is With the Airmen by Jay Hendry. And we're not entirely sure too much about this, but it was published by the Beamsville Express, so it is very likely that um, it, it, it is about the Beamsville Aerodrome. So, and I just wanted to mention that there are a lot of books on this subject, both uh, fictional and nonfiction, um, if you're interested, at both the Beamsville and Fleming Library. Thank you very much, everybody.